Well, every one of us, including the Gladden pulpit right here, has a story. And I'll tell you a story about the Gladden pulpit before beginning the sermon. Years ago, I was looking through the church archives and came across a photograph, a photograph of our old church at 74 East Broad Street being torn to the ground with a wrecking ball. And for those who don't know its location, it's actually the open lot behind Key Bank on this side of the street on Capitol Square. But what was most interesting about the picture was in the middle of the picture, with all of the ceiling of the church gone, the roof of the church gone, was the Gladden pulpit, to which I can only imagine that someone here at 444 East Broad woke up that morning and said, we gotta get the pulpit out before the whole church is destroyed. You see, the pulpit had stayed with the building when we moved here because it was a Baptist church. So thanks be to God for the person who took the picture at the dispatch many years ago and for the person who went and retrieved this so it wasn't just knocked into dust. That's my story of the pulpit. Let us join together in prayer. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of each one of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our salvation. Amen. Difficult and dangerous times. Prophetic voices marginalized and finally silenced as a threat to others. Intolerant religious and political leaders who hold disdain for those they call deviants. Hungry people holding on to what they have, afraid that it may be their last meal. This describes the climate of today's gospel but it sure sounds a lot like the times we're living in. The disciples know Jesus as the prophet rejected by his own. They also see him lead in a way that has never been done before and feed thousands of hungry people with just a little bit of bread and a little bit of fish and find that they're all satisfied. All of this happens just after John the Baptist the prophetic preacher closest to Jesus has been senselessly beheaded and martyred by a deranged ruler. That's a lot to handle. It's no wonder fear is somewhere in this text today. Following the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000, Jesus slips away to pray by himself on the mountainside and pushes the boat out with the disciples in it to get a little peace and quiet. Now the disciples leave the land and they go out alone on the water. And it's sort of like, I don't know, sort of like group therapy for them or something. It, it's uh, the first time the 12 have ever been alone together. And remember, not all of them are fishermen. They don't all know what to do in a boat. Some of them are tax collectors who don't know what to do in a boat. They are land creatures and now they're at sea. In this climate and context, our story begins. Is it any wonder the disciples are fearful? They are all about to die in turbulent waters. Matthew, Mark, and John each narrate a version of the storm and Jesus calming and the disciples at the sea. But Matthew focuses on one important person and he's the only one to tell the story of Peter. What's the deal with Peter? Well, he is a big deal in Matthew's Gospel, where he is named 24 times. He's among the first disciples called. Jesus visits his home and heals his mother-in-law there. Peter assumes the role of speaker for the group. And beyond that, Peter stars in three stories that have a similar plot. We'll return to some of that a little later. Today's Stormy Sea account his proclamation of the faith that he has in Jesus and his denial of Jesus during the passion and the crucifixion of our Lord. By the same plot, Peter, the rock of faith, in each of these stories becomes a pebble. He rises and falls on the sea, on the land, and in the moment where Jesus most needs him as he's facing crucifixion. The scene of today's incidents has the disciples boarding their boat just after Jesus has preached all day to the multitude. In this scene, 
when the disciples suggest that Jesus send people home to eat, you remember he tells them to offer their meager provisions to feed the 5,000. And as our fine preacher last week said, the important phrase, and the women, it was the women who fed them. Well, let's give a little credit to Jesus too. You would agree with that, right? So the women the, and the kids got together, everybody got together, it happened. Even more preposterous than the proposal that the crowd should share bread and fish until they're satisfied is the one that says you will all be fed by the Spirit of God, right? But there it is, he does it and more. They are still prayerfully processing the feeding miracle of the day as they seek the catch of the night. Last week, as we heard, this is an important moment when the disciples get to figure out what a miracle is and what it looks like. Once on the water, though, they get caught in a storm. While the waves have their way with the boat and the disciples are fighting for their lives, Jesus walks toward them across the sea. Because his appearance was the last thing they expected, they figured they were looking at a ghost, perhaps a scene of their own death. Now, last night, Susan and I were watching the movie Ghost. You know, it's like they like tell you it's the end, right? <laughs> so, so that's what they're afraid of. They think they see a ghost. They think they're looking into the future of eternity. And then, as all God's great messengers do, Jesus says, do not be afraid. Peter, a sterling example of the dictum that anything worth doing is worth overdoing, decides to test the waters. If it's really you, call to me to join you out there, he says to Jesus, and Jesus says, come. Now Peter loves Jesus with a wild heart, a wild mind, and a wild soul. Add to that a drenched body. What a test. If it is you, let me walk on water. Does Peter even consider what will happen if it's not Jesus out there? Because he's ready to launch out of the boat. He jumps overboard in every sense. And he starts to do what Jesus was doing. For a quick minute, it works. Peter is walking on water. Now, if you are all believers, you can do this too. I'm just saying, it works. Then Peter looks down and gets a little bit overwhelmed. Being overwhelmed is what sinks him. It's, if not for Jesus, Peter would have sunk like a rock. As, P, as Jesus pulls Peter's head above the water, he says, oh, you of little faith, which is one of those great lines in the Bible. And we all wonder, was that necessary? How fair is that? Peter has just risked his life to take a chance on you, Jesus. Wouldn't it have been nicer if you said something like, great try, Pete. He could have asked Peter what happened, but no, Jesus says, oh, you of little faith. There's a subtle and costly dynamic in all of this. On the hillside near the lake, Jesus has told his disciples to give everything they have to others. It worked for everyone to eat. Then, when they're in mortal danger only, Peter takes a crazy risk. Although he sinks in doubt, it is his daring and somewhat delirious faith that brings him into a new relationship with Jesus. Jesus has now truly saved Peter. At least this once, Peter has risked it all. He has put his bet on Jesus. He has given his life over to him. And in the midst of not doing other things right, he's done this right. And Jesus does not miss this at all. Matthew leads us to ask who understands Jesus better. The one who did homage in the boat, or like the Magi came and brought their gift and returned home, or the wild and wet ones, like Peter, who go out into the water and Jesus saves them. And it looks like pure folly on the surface, but Peter's risky expression of faith is much greater than the boat spectators who are simply worshiping him. Risk, failure, and redemption are Peter's pattern. He repeats this over and over when he proclaims Jesus as the Messiah and then tells him how to do it. He does it again when after swearing he will die for Jesus, denies he ever knew the man, right? And he goes off in silence by himself, weeping for the denial. Peter offers us an example of extravagance. 
Fear of failure doesn't stop him. He keeps growing closer to Jesus who appreciates his passion rather than worrying about his weaknesses. Jesus doesn't criticize the group who stayed in the boat, by the way. They gave him proper homage when they hung on for dear life. But Peter loves Jesus differently. He loves him in a wild heart and mind and soulful way and a drenched body. Peter's very doubts allow him to go deeper. Maybe we should all hear this, you of little faith, as an invitation to true faith. Peter shows us how to risk the depths. His example dares us, too, to do what Jesus did. And today's word for all of us should be God's word to us, come. It's the only remedy for our little faith. It is also a perfect guide into the social gospel. That's right. Bear with me. I love this gospel story. It has all the ingredients for us as we seek to live the social gospel for today. We have the context or the climate. We have the text itself. And finally, we have the relationships that point us toward a more just society. On the surface, you may be scratching your head. But, it look, it, but look a little deeper and you'll see how Jesus calls us all to do the same. First, the context, or in the words of a friend of mine, the climate is everything in the social gospel. Remember, it is the gospel that is placed in the social context. It's called the social gospel, but it's the gospel first. And the gospel of Jesus Christ is our heartbeat and our guide. Nothing we do apart from this pulse of life and faith matters as we serve others. In my book, The Genius of Justice, one of the geniuses, Reverend Dr. Ron Lucky, or as he likes to call himself, Lucky, isn't he lucky one, right? He calls himself Lucky, speaks to me in our conversation as one of the 53 geniuses. Lucky says this, Justice is a climate that exists when all people are treated with dignity. Treat people with dignity and always keep the pressure on and always keep pushing forward, he said. It is in this climate that social change happens. Justice is a marathon, it is not a sprint. He continues, hope always shows up when our sleeves are rolled up. We can never sit back and hope change will come. We have to get out there and get busy and remember that the work we do is never our work. It is always God's work. We are just a part of, as he says, God's makeup. I love that. In the climate of the Gospels, we find our call to action. Context is everything. Again, from Robert McAfee Brown, we learned three important lessons that I've shared with you over the years about proximity and context. Dr. Brown taught me this years ago, three important lessons. Number one, where you stand will determine what you see. Where you stand will determine what you see. Number two, whom you stand with will determine what you hear. Whom you stand with will determine what you hear. And what you see and what you hear will determine what you say and what you do. Think about that. It's really true. And, and, and it, it can be applied across anything we do in life. Beyond context or climate, we have something else at work in this story of the social gospel. It is text, the text of scripture to guide us on our pathway of justice today. Dr. Walter Brueggemann is the foremost biblical scholar of our times. Hands down, drop the mic. Now 90 plus, Walter says he's not writing anymore, which is really funny because I invited him to do the forward to my book, which is the best part of the book, and he did it in a day, so he still writes. But the vitality of his words, based on his intense and intentional study of God's word, is alive and well. Our former Gladden lecturer, Dr. Brueggemann, when we were together in the summer of 2021, Walter said this, he sees justice in every text of the scripture, not just a few quotable and memorable ones like Micah 6, 8, Matthew 25. He sees it from Genesis 1, 1 through Revelation 22:21. 21. 
He sees God's justice initiative in every breath, every word, every verse, every chapter, every book. We are all called, he says, into prophetic imagination, which is the capacity to entertain a world other than the one that is right in front of us. He continues, it seems to me that is exactly what the Bible wants us to do all the time. It invites us to host a world other than the one we see. And justice is the task of apportioning the abundant common good so that every member can live a life of dignity and security. It is about distributive justice. We see this in the Exodus story, when manna comes from heaven for the people in the desert. We also experience it in Holy Communion, which is a manifestation of well, as well of the feeding of each of us in food and drink. We are schooled too often in a system of scarcity, but the prophets and Jesus always call us to live into abundance of life and living, to share what we have so that no one is without food or work or housing or education and more. The text of scripture calls us to this task over and over and over again. Walter has given what I believe is the best definition of justice. It is simply this. We have to figure out what belongs to whom and return it to those from whom it has been taken. Listen again to that. We have to figure out what belongs to whom and return it to those from whom it has been taken. For me, the model of this, I mean, there's many. You can apply this again in many ways for the work of justice. But for me, the Me Too movement was all about this. Women were raped, their dignity was taken away from them, their vitality, everything about their person that was sacred and beautiful was stripped away. And what they were claiming and what they were crying for as they came together was to have that return to bring it back to them, to no longer go through any of that ever again. That's the work of justice. And God is calling us to do no less than this work. Beyond context and text, the social gospel today must ground itself always and forever in relationships. Or in the words of doc, Dr. Gladden, friendship. Now, some of you have heard me quote this like a million times, so this is a million and one my favorite quote from Dr. Gladden. In his autobiography, Recollections, he writes in the last chapter, almost the last page of his book, now at the age of 76, although he died at 82, he writes these words. I am fain to believe that the time is drawing near when the Christian church will be able to discern and declare the simple truth that religion is nothing but friendship. Friendship with God and with all people. I have been thinking about it a lot in these last days. You know, at the end of your life, you do think about things a little differently, I'm not saying, but here he is bringing us the depth of his vision. I've been thinking about it a lot in these last days, and I cannot make anything else. So far as I can see it, this is all there is to it. Religion is friendship. Friendship first with the great companion of whom Jesus told us is always nearer to us than we are to ourselves and whose inspiration and help is the greatest fact of human existence. To be in harmony with God's purposes, to be open to God's suggestions, to be in conscious fellowship with him, that is religion on the Godward side. And then turning to humans, friendship sums it all up. To be friends with everybody, to fill every human relationship with the spirit of friendship. Is there anything more than this? that the wisest and best of women and men can hope to do? No, <laughs> the answer is no. The social gospel 100 years ago as well as today is all about relationships. It's all about relationships. It's about struggling through these relationships and through the friendships. It is as simple as, and as hard as that. In Jacob Dorn's classic on Gladden, Washington Gladden, prophet of the social gospel, he tells a story about Gladden's struggle with two of the trustees of the church. So anyone who's a trustee is now awake, right? Like, I was a trustee, am I a trustee? <laughs> yes. So he tells the story of his struggle with two of the trustees of the church. Both of them were intimately and personally involved in the mining that was going on in Southeast Ohio, right? In the mines 
here in Ohio, and there was a miners' strike. And he went to their homes and spoke to them and said, you are wrong about where you stand, and you need to restore justice to the men who are miners in your companies who were being stripped away of all their dignity. And both men came this close to leaving the church. They struggled in their relationship when he preached against their minds. And by the way, I don't know about you, but in the work that you do, other people in the pews do know what you do, so when a preacher is preaching about that work and the people doing it, you all know who that is, right? <laughs> so, so he preached against it. They worked hard on their relationship in the months and years ahead, but both men stuck with it and stayed in the church. That's because they had wives, I'm sure, who talked sense into them. But they stayed with it. They didn't give up. See, we have a lot to learn about how when we disagree with each other, that's the point at which we begin to really grow. It's in those disagreements and the struggles that we all kind of learn something new about ourselves. A lot new in my case. As Martin Marty said 30 years ago, in the old days, it took three bad pastors in a row for a person to leave the church. Now it takes a parishioner three bad feelings to leave the church. And that was written 30 years ago. I would say it's like one bad feeling now. Gladden worked on all the relationships and friendships with people in all spheres of church and society. Perhaps that was his greatest gift to this world. He was genuinely a lover of humanity. We can all learn from him on this. Let me put it another way. This pulpit, this church, this congregation, the senior minister of our social gospel worked to bring people together. And I feel like the gift we have, the charism that we have here in this congregation is to work to bring people together, to not divide people further, but to model what Jesus showed us and live into that. The social gospel matters today in so many ways. For those who are left behind, forgotten, forsaken, and unforgiven, the social gospel offers a hand up. It offers a way to connect and help. And for those who have enough and may feel they don't need to face their siblings who are poor and struggling, it offers no less than redemption and true salvation. We can only truly be saved together. That was the point of the social gospel. When all of us have dignity and respect, when all of us have equal pay for the work we do, when all of us have a table on which to place bread that we earned and put on that table for the daily bread, and then when we have the ability to break it and share it with others, that will be the day of the kingdom coming. Or in the words of Washington Glad, it's this. Let's be friends with everybody. Let's fill every human relationship with the spirit of friendship. Is there anything more than this? that the wisest and best of women and men can hope to do. Amen.